Welcome, AP Biology students, to Unit 7, Lecture Topics 6, 7, and 8. Here we're going to look at evidence of evolution and common ancestry. So overwhelming evidence supports the theory of evolution. You, you really need to keep in mind that in science, our, our current thoughts and ideas um, that support our, our hypotheses and theories are based on evidence. And the evidence that supports the theory of evolution uh, basically includes the fossil, things such as the fossil record, um, comparative morphology. Uh, when we think of, of morphology, we're looking at uh, analyzing uh, the structures, the form of, of different living things, um, and also biogeography. So let's take a look at each of these three things as they play a role or, or, or as they play a role as a source of evidence for evolution. And understand that what we, what we believe now in the theory of evolution can change if new evidence um, supports that change. So with the fossil record, basically um, fossils remain, uh, fossils are remains or traces of past organisms. Um, so when we think of, of fossils, we usually think of things that are extinct now. Um, fossil records uh, g gives a visual of evolutionary change over time. And ultimately, fossils can be dated by examining the rate of carbon-14 decay, uh, which is a radioactive element there, an isotope of the carbon-12 atom, and the age of rocks where the fossils are found. This ultimately gives some, some sort of geographical data for the organisms that are found. Um, kind of make connections there. Uh, where were they found? What is the habitat like? Um, do you see similar animal animals, plants, etc., or any living thing? Um, do you see it located on other continents that may have matched up when there was one supercontinent known as Pangaea? So these are all things that we look for in, in, uh, in the fossil record. The other thing would be ca comparative morphology. And in comparative morphology, basically we're analyzing the structures of things that are currently living, or what we would call extant species, and those that are now uh, gone, have disappeared from Earth, and those would be extinct organisms. And when we study homology, basically homology is looking at the characteristics in related species that have similarities, even if the functions of those characteristics are different. So there, there are, uh, when we look at homology, um, one of the things we might look at is embryonic homology. And many species have very similar embryonic development. Um, if you think of the development of a human embryo, there's a point in the development of a human embryo where you can't tell, is that going to be a, a chicken, or is it going to be a human, or is it going to be some other sort of animal, because of the, the shared characteristics or similarities that uh, many species, like a human and a chicken, share through that embryonic development. We also look at vestigial structures. Um, vestigial structures are going to be those structures that are conserved even though they no longer have a use within that particular organism. And an example, if you think of, of the coccyx or the tailbone in humans and uh, the appendix in, in humans as well. Um, for example, the tailbone, as the name implies, the tailbone or the coccyx, of the, which is the, the scientific name for it, um, that would have been the attachment point for a tail. But we as humans no longer have tails, but we still have evidence of having that tailbone in us. There's also molecular homology, and molecular homology is when many species share similar DNA and amino acid sequences um, when we think of, of protein building and stuff like that. So taking a look at, at uh, uh, comparative morphology a little bit further, um, we'll go in and look at what are, what are these things called homologous structures. So comparative morphology, remember that you're analyzing the structures of organisms or those characteristics 
of those organisms that are similar, even though their functions may be a little bit different. So homologous structures um, are structures that are characteristics that are, are similar in two species because they share that common ancestor. And if we look, the example will be the arm bones in, in many species. So here you can see the, the, a frog. Um, so here you can see what the, the uh, arm bones of the frog look like. Here's that of a lizard. Here's that of what a bird. Here's the human, cat, whale. This will be a bat here. So the, these are very similar in, in structure, but their, their, their functions may be a little bit different. So there's this idea of convergent evolution. And convergent evolution is when similar adaptations that have evolved in distantly related organisms due to similar environments. Um, we could take, for example, analogous structures. And analogous structures are structures that are similar but have separate, separate uh, evolutionary origins. And an example of this, if we look at wings, um, you have wings in birds versus bees versus the, the wings in, in bats. All of those structures, are, uh, the structures that are similar um, is the wing, and they all have that purpose of flight, but ultimately they have separate evolutionary origins. So although each species, such as the, the, the bird, the bat, and the bees, each species have wings, but the wings did not originate from from a common ancestor. But they do serve that, that kind of same purpose, which would be the purpose of flight. So in comparative morphology, when we look at structural evidence, it indicates common ancestry of all eukaryotes. And ultimately, many fundamental and uh, cellular features and processes are conserved across organisms. And when we think of, of some of those cellular examples or cellular processes, we think of things like membrane-bound organelles, like the mitochondria and the chloroplast and lysosomes. Um, we might think of things like linear chromosomes um, and, how, how, and how those are, are fundamentally conserved and the same across organisms. Um, we also look at the introns in genes. Remember, the introns are those non-coding regions of DNA that usually get spliced out and the exons get moved together. Um, but those two serve as some cellular examples here of, of common ancestry of all eukaryotes. Now let's take a look at biogeography. Biogeography is the distribution of animals and plants geographically. Um, when we think of biogeography, we could think of species on oceanic islands resemble mainland species. Um, example, uh, another example would be the species on the same continent that are similar and distinct from species on other continents. So you have those that, if in the first example, those are, are organisms that are in two separate locations but resemble each other. In the second example, we have two species on the same continent, same general location, um, but they're distinct uh, from, from the uh, species on other continents. So biogeography is just looking at how the distribution of uh, animals and plants are, are based on th their geographical location. So let's, let's do a few practice uh, examples here. So quick review, what type of data provides evidence for evolution? Fossil data, biogeography, and morphology. Number two, in terms of natural selection, how can structures become vestigial? Oh, this is a good one. So remember in, 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 a, in the notes, when we looked at vestigial structures, when we looked, talked about morphology, uh, vestigial structures are, are basically 
um, those are going to be those structures that are conserved. Um, the, the structures that are conserved, um, even though they may not have any use. And, and I talked about the uh, human, the, the coccyx, the tailbone, or the appendix. So in terms of natural selection, how can those structures become vestigial, like the, the tailbone in humans? A structure may have been useful at one time, such as the tailbone, but maybe there was a mutation that rendered it useless. Therefore, it was conserved across generations, neither being selected for or selected against. Putting it all together. Ultimately, remember, as always in biology, it's populations that evolve, not individuals. So populations will continue to evolve and genomes change. And examples of genomes changing would be things like antibiotic resistance and bacteria, insect resistance to pesticides, and pathogens that cause emerging new diseases. So that's pretty much it for this lecture. I thank you for joining me and have a great day.